I wonder if maybe at this point, Tom, if you might um, just summarize sort of your input regarding the strategy itself, some uh, maybe major points that you would want to reinforce regarding um, the strategy and anything else regarding, uh, as they alluded to in their comments, uh, the, the uh, national broadband, excuse me, broadband plan that uh, you participated in. Sure, absolutely, thank you. Um, first of all, um, I wanted to let everyone know that um, we, in looking at the, uh, the plan, Moldova 2020 plan, uh, it's very impressive, uh, very thorough and comprehensive. So we applaud you for uh, producing a document that uh, really hits all of the key factors that we believe uh, should be considered in developing a national strategy. Um, the second point is every country is different and there is no one uh, correct way to uh, implement and design a broadband plan. It needs to take into account uh, cultural differences, content differences, uh, regulatory and legal differences uh, that we all have. Um, that being said, the one unifying element that we have seen uh, universally from many of our counterparts uh, in countries around the world is the benefits that accrue to citizens, to governments, uh, to uh, targeted groups uh, within populations, elderly, uh, students, from a more advanced and robust broadband infrastructure in a country. Uh, and that's obviously one of the reasons that many countries are putting a focus on the broadband rollout, deployment, and adoption. It's for those, uh, what we refer to in our plan as uh, national purposes, uh, which are you know economic, education, Healthcare, which is a huge issue that we're uh, finding that our broadband policies are impacting, as well as relations with, uh, you know, communications among our citizens, uh, having a more reliable, resilient, uh, alternative form of communication between people, whether it be uh, internet-based, uh, IP, telephony-based. In getting there, I think you, in, in your plan, you've, um, you know, you've laid out an excellent uh, roadmap, uh, very impressive uh, metrics and indices that you're, you're going to want to see implemented uh, down the road, including your, you know, the speeds, target speeds for increasing the population that you're trying to reach, increasing that, and those are all very uh, wise uh, and easy, uh, easily measured uh, ways of finding that our broadband is actually, our plans are actually working. I, I'd like to just address a couple of issues um, at a very generic high level based on our experience uh, and kind of where we've left off, and then I can answer uh, particular questions or go into uh, the high points of uh, some things that we've noted in the uh, Moldova digital plan uh, that we uh, it's already written but I can be happy to talk through that um, so do you have any beginning questions or would you like me to go right into kind of an update from the US perspective on some things that we've done since the adoption of our plan I think it is better to start with an U.S. Uh, update, and then we will come with our questions that, uh, that can appear. Well, great. Thank you. Um, and please, to interrupt, uh, ask questions. If I'm addressing something that you want to go into a little bit of deeper detail with, I'm very happy. This isn't. Yeah. I would not consider that rude. I want to consider this a dialogue. And, uh, be very respectful to your, your questions and being able to help you. Um, so in the U.S., uh, we've seen significant progress over the last few years. Uh, about uh, 
78% of the U.S. population now lives in an area with wired broadband infrastructure capable of delivering broadband speeds of 50 megabits per second or more. Uh, and that is up from just 20% of the population from three years ago. So we've, we've seen uh, very good progress. In the U.S., uh, our fixed internet service providers now deliver 96% of the advertised speeds that they uh, promote when they try and get customers to sign up. Um, and that's one thing that we've strived to measure is the actual performance of speeds versus what companies are telling their customers uh, they're signing up for that service. So uh, that would be one factor that you may want to consider down the road is uh, once the companies knew that we were doing that, we believe it, uh, it made them want to make sure that their infrastructure was up to speed, up to the test of uh, not falling down on the uh, advertised scale because uh, customers might go to another company, for example. So uh, that's something as their competitive environment gets more robust, uh, that's something that you can put that on. Uh, we have a great team of people here who help develop the speed measurements, uh, and we'd be happy to dwell into a more specific topic on that. Um, however, among all those great things that I just said, in the U.S., we still have a lot of work to do. Um, our most recent data shows that there is a gap in broadband among our uh, most vulnerable populations. Uh, about 15 million Americans still lack access to fixed broadband service. Uh, of at least four megabits per second download and one megabit per second upload. Uh, the majority of those people uh, live in rural areas of the U.S. where companies have found to be less profitable for them to run infrastructure, wire or uh, you know, towers uh, to serve the handful of people. Um, we also, in the U.S., are seeing that there are significant differences in adoption of broadband. Uh, even in areas where there's fixed broadband is available, other competitive broadband is available, uh, approximately 54% of U.S. households do not subscribe. Uh, so we're working on uh, issues to not only accelerate the deployment of broadband throughout the U.S., but also the adoption of broadband services. Um, and we're doing that through a couple of means. One is through using our universal service program in the US, uh, which traditionally had been used to provide uh, copper voice uh, subsidies to uh, Americans who either were low income or in rural areas where infrastructure wasn't rolling out. We've now used that fund to fund broadband. So we've seen the, the benefit of investing in the more robust, resilient broadband network infrastructure instead of uh, copper infrastructure. And that was uh, done last year uh, in the US where we performed our, our universal service fund to refocus the target of what we're trying to deliver in those areas. Um, we're also trying to encourage competition and investment in broadband networks in the U.S. Uh, we've taken several steps to promote broadband development to hard to reach areas in the U.S., but we've also adopted forms to our program uh, universal service in both the fixed and the mobile broadband. Uh, so we're not just focusing in the U.S. on fixed infrastructure, we're also focusing on mobile infrastructure for broadband. And that is becoming a more and more popular way uh, that we've seen in the U.S. of uh, people accessing uh, broadband networks. Uh, in doing that, our new, uh, we've come out with something called the Connect America Fund, uh, which provides up to uh, four and a half billion U.S. dollars a year to make services available in areas 
where they otherwise would not be provided. Uh, by August of this year, we had internet service providers in 44 of our states, our regional uh, uh, jurisdictional areas, and uh, one of our territories, Puerto Rico, had requested over $385 million US from that fund and uh, that's going to help approximately 600,000 homes and small businesses that lack broadband start to get that broadband service. Uh, the other big initiative that has happened here in the U.S. with respect to our broadband is that in June, President Obama announced an initiative called Connect Ed, E-D. That initiative aims to connect 99% of America's students to the internet through a higher speed broadband uh, with fiber and wireless technologies within five years. Uh, as part of the connect Yes, yes. Tom, um, I'm sorry, could you just repeat that last? I, I, we, we missed that last part on the definition of connect ed. Sure. Sorry. Connect ed is a program announced by President Obama in June that seeks to deliver to 99% of America's students high speed broadband using both fiber and wireless technologies within five years. And as part of that, the FCC is moving to modernize another one of our older universal service funding mechanisms called the E, capital E, dash rate universal service program to better support and increase the broadband capacity delivered to America's schools and libraries. Um, and interestingly here I noted in the Moldova plan you, you do follow a similar, you have a very similar goal uh, which I applaud because I think reaching the student population, uh, the future human capital of all of our economies and populations, uh, providing them with these educational opportunities that broadband can deliver will improve you know, our societies immensely. So I think that's, that's a key point, it's a key point in our broadband plan and we're thrilled that uh, the Connected program has, has uh, come to fruition. The other area where we're trying to help meet the demands of mobile broadband in the U.S. is uh, through free and up more spectrum. And in the U.S., we're in somewhat of a spectrum crunch uh, as people have adopted smartphone technology uh, as well as regular cell phone technology. The impact on the networks has uh, Increase dramatically uh, to the point where uh, an Apple uh, or a Samsung tablet uh, or a smart device uh, uses you know anywhere from 10 to you know 100 times the amount of, of data that a regular telephone call would use. So that's putting a huge demand on spectrum in our uh, more populated areas of the U.S. As a result, we've done a couple of things and uh, are planning for future development to help provide more spectrum to our carriers. Uh, one is we've freed up vacant spectrum between our digital television channels. Uh, and we call those white spaces. And those were essentially the buffer, the buffer uh, assignments between broadcasting stations. We've made those available for unlicensed broadband use. So as long as you're operating as a uh, wireless provider uh, within the parameters that we lay out there, you don't need to come to us for a license to use that. You can develop your own network infrastructure and start transmitting in those areas to your customers. Uh, and that's really helped tremendously here in the US with the spectrum. We're also working with other government agencies to free up spectrum that has been assigned to uh, federal, uh, the federal sector here in the U.S. Uh, that is not being currently 
utilized or allocated. Uh, and in June, uh, as another initiative, the President announced uh, $100 million in federal investments for spectrum sharing research and contracts and other research on advanced communications. Again, recognizing the benefits, uh, both economic as well as to citizens, of uh, expanding broadband to uh, the population. Next year, in 2014, the FCC is uh, planning to hold the first incentive auction. Uh, the incentive auction here is an innovative, market-based approach that will further free up spectrum that's currently being used by broadcasters to help meet the growing consumer demand for mobile broadband. The spectrum in the auction will be voluntarily contributed by current licensees like TV broadcasters, uh, who in return will receive a portion of the proceeds of the auction. Uh, and then that freed up spectrum will then be reallocated for flexible wireless broadband services. So again, uh, while we've made significant progress over the last three years uh, since our broadband plan was uh, adopted and rolled out, uh, we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, and we're still uh, you know, learning lessons and uh, you know, eager to uh, see what other countries are doing as well as share uh, our experiences so that we can best uh, all move forward in the global environment toward uh, more, pro more broadband capacity for populations. Um, again, I'll uh, stop here and then we can you know, talk about uh, you know, approaches on the plans or uh, other things, but I did want to give you that overview of kind of where the U.S. is currently at since our broadband. Do you have any questions on that? Any, any areas you want to find out? Okay. Of course, thank, thank you for this uh, uh, update. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, the, the comments that we have received by, uh, by email was very valuable because uh, uh, we, we first uh, had to see the, our own proposals in perspective of the US experience of the National Broadband Plan Development. and. Uh, Comparing these proposals was a very good exercise for us and really very valuable for us. Thank you. Thank you a lot for, for these comments. Uh, I also noted for me several questions, but I didn't want to interrupt you during, uh, during, during your presentation. Uh, we, we also have uh, a, uh, an issue of uh, covering with broadband uh, the rural areas and uh, your experience of uh, the Universal Service Fund. Uh, especially creating uh, the, uh, the resilient broadband networks in the rural area is, uh, is very interesting for us. In fact, as a part of, uh, of, of the uh, digital agenda, uh, we will be developing the uh, Universal Service uh, Fund uh, program. And uh, uh, one of the topics uh, uh, that, that we are planning to do is uh, to get rid of uh, the traditional approach of uh, voice, uh, as you mentioned, voice uh, sent by the copper uh, lines to the data and internet sent by the fiber optics. Uh, that's why we have envisaged to have uh, at least one point of presence of the uh, fiber optic networks in, uh, in, in a village, meaning the village having the mayor's office. Uh, we haven't specified that it should be a school or a, a, a university, but we said that it should be at least one point of presence. Uh, what we are interested in to, to see what are the mechanisms of uh, promoting this, uh, because we have it as a general uh, idea, but we don't have the, uh, the tools how to, how to bring this fiber optics uh, to to this, uh, to every village of Moldova, as well as uh, the way it would be interesting, you mentioned about the uh, good financing that we have and the Universal Service Fund. What are the sources of funding in, uh, in, in this fund? Uh, is it the government, the private companies, or is it joint uh, structure between the government and the company? I think it's great. 
appreciate your considering uh, using the universal service funding mechanism as a means to uh, further develop the, the broadband. I think that's uh, what we're seeing in, in many countries that we've been working with. And in fact, uh, is another initiative we've been participating with, with our um, U.S. Uh, Agency for International Development in America, the uh, the, the president uh, last year, um, at the summit of the Americas, uh, is trying to advance uh, the broadband partnership of the Americas, and as part of that. People we're working with at the U.S. Agency for International Development uh, in the Latin American Caribbean region have been working uh, with uh, a group, uh, other regulators, other universal service fund uh, providers to uh, enhance and roll out broadband connectivity. There could be uh, certainly lessons learned from those interactions that we'd be happy to share with you. As we uh, capture those issues, so, you know, many countries are working on reforming uh, universal service to meet broadband uh, challenges, and we'd be happy to. Uh, I'm very sorry. I have one one comment. Uh, uh, I was asking yeah. about the American experience, and uh, uh, in fact, I, I was thinking uh, of uh, learning how the uh, American fund. Established and what are the tools used to, to develop the broadband in rural areas of the United States? So that was the core of, of the question. What are the tools to, to develop and how the U.S. fund is being done? Uh, Caribbean experience might be interesting, but still for us the U.S. experience is more relevant on, on, that, uh, on that topic. Thank you. Sure, no, no problem. I'll just connect uh, some other groups that are trying to reform the universal service. So our experience, our fund has been long established in the U.S. Uh, through uh, charging uh, companies uh, uh, very small rates over time to uh, traffic both local and regional calls, calls that they've made uh, that we've amassed a fund to help uh, roll out and provide uh, at first, you know, the copper services uh, was now reformed to the broadband services. The funding, the particular funding mechanisms uh, that we have established um, is the Connect America Fund, where internet service providers can make a request through the fund administrator to uh, ask for funding in return for uh, the promise or delivery of fiber uh, or wireless build out of broadband to a targeted area. Uh, we have uh, a group that administers the funds and reviews the funds, uh, follows up with enforcement. Uh, mechanism to ensure that the funds are being used as as stated, uh, and going to uh, more specific on on that area, uh, as I'm not the one who does the actual administration of that fund, but I'd be happy to provide you with some more detailed information on that, or have people come and uh, get set up another video conference to get to the uh, specifics of how that's actually done. Um, sorry, I, I have to interrupt and I, and I apologize for this. I have another yes. meeting, so I'm going to have to leave you. But I just wanted to thank you, Tom, very much uh, on behalf of the group for your significant contribution to uh, putting this together, together because we wouldn't have been able to manage any sort of response without your commitment. So thank you very much. And to my Moldovan colleagues, um, I'd be very interested in next steps when you come to conclude on this discussion. You know, how we're going to take this forward, what, what if anything we want from the group uh, as next steps as, as, as we go towards the end of this year. 
Um, thank you all. Apologies. I, I, I'm very sorry, but I have to be we can, we, else now. we can um, continue talking, but I'll leave it to talk. Okay, and and I hope to be in touch with you very soon, Thomas. Thank you again. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, take uh, care. Okay, okay. I, I'd like to thank you for your personal contribution and for mediating this uh, discussion. And we uh, are thank, uh, thankful for, for all the support from uh, NATO Secret Secretariat. So thank well, you very much and thank well, you to your colleagues. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for that. We're, we're very much looking forward to continuing. And to, uh, I should really thank, um, address my thanks to my co-chair and to Tina, who were really instrumental in putting this together. But my, my great pleasure, and I look forward to working with you closely in the months to come. Apologies for being there. Uh, See you later. Yeah. Um, the, 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 other area of universal service um, mechanisms that we've changed um, that you'd be interested in. Uh, is dealing with the, uh, the growth in mobile here in the U.S. And uh, with that, we've done uh, a number of initiatives that have helped further develop uh, the mobile infrastructure here in the U.S. so that consumers can benefit from uh, the rollout of wireless broadband. And one of those key things is something that you're going to in your plan, you said you're going to go through in 2015, uh, which is your digital switchover. Um, that freed up here in the US uh, our 700 megahertz spectrum, um, which will for you be different, it will be the 800 megahertz spectrum. But that was a, uh, a tremendous, tremendous benefit for us in helping uh, meet the demand that came from citizens for mobile usage, increased mobile usage, as well as the mobile internet, mobile uh, broadband usage that's emerged from that. Uh, you know, with, without that transition, without that uh, successful uh, movement, uh, we we would not have that advanced in the mobile uh, broadband uh, work that we currently have. So uh, I think. For you, and you've recognized that in your plan, uh, the importance of a successful implementation on the uh, digital transition, and that's going to be another uh, important issue. Uh, again, I would want to offer uh, another exchange that we can have just on that topic, if you would like. I know you're probably uh, you know, well well aware on those areas, but you know, we've learned some lessons the hard way uh, in the U.S on that. Uh, it took us uh, 13 years and uh, there were a lot of political issues involved, but um, you know, along the way we can, uh, there are certain points that we'd be happy to share with you as you move forward in that area. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, first of all, for the Universal Service Fund experience, uh, we, uh, we also are planning to charge the companies uh, that are giving the telecommunication services to, uh, to Moldova uh, for their contributions to the Universal Service Fund. And uh, uh, the more information that we have about the, the process of filing the request to, um, for funding from Connect America funding, to, it would be very interesting for us uh, how it is made, how the uh, request has been uh, proceeded. And uh, also you mentioned the very valuable thing that uh, both uh, fixed line technologies and the mobile technologies can be used. Uh, for us, it's, uh, as, uh, it's an important uh, uh, experience as uh, we also want to have our provision technology neutral, not to say that only one technology may be used uh, by the universal service funding, but have a, a neutral approach. So uh, the way of uh, getting the right choice between the, the technologies and the requests is uh, as an, as interesting and important for us. Also, you mentioned about the digital TV switchover, uh, which in fact uh, I, um, I put a, a question mark for me from the very beginning that the uh, that, uh, United States uh, had a lot of experience in, uh, uh, in this transition and in uh, uh, making the uh, clients uh, uh, ready and aware of uh, accepting the change. Here we, uh, we are just starting to, to inform our clients and uh, just today we had a discussion with uh, 
some uh, colleagues from uh, other countries, they told us that it still requires a lot of uh, effort and a lot of time. So uh, here the, uh, uh, the, process, uh, the, the ways of uh, inform the people and to, to make them involved in the process is, is, is important for us. And also one, one more question that I want to raise is, uh, you mentioned about the white spaces and uh, uh, the, the question is about white spaces. We have heard the, the different initiatives on the white spaces usage, the technical details on the, the power limitations for, for, for these devices uh, would, would be interesting for us and for, for our colleagues from uh, the National Frequency Center in order to uh, assess and to evaluate the possibility of uh, using the white spaces in, in Moldova as well. And you mentioned on the spectrum auction in 2014, we, we are also planning the spectrum auction next year, so if you can uh, provide us some more data on the spectrum auction or uh, give us uh, the link to, to look into uh, on, on that, that would be interesting. Thank you. Uh, what, um, what frequencies were you going to be auctioning in 2014? Uh, we are planning to auction uh, the 900 megahertz frequency, which is uh, currently uh, the second generation GSM network is being deployed, and uh, 1800 megahertz, uh, which is also 2G networks uh, deployed. So these uh, two frequencies we are auctioning. And uh, also we are planning to start uh, looking at the digital dividend, which is 800 megahertz, as you mentioned, uh, uh, in, in this region. So uh, we are also uh, thinking of that frequency as well. Great, I'd be happy to send uh, information that we developed uh, in those areas that you've mentioned uh, during the auctions. Um, white spaces, the digital dividend and the transition process, as well as the USF contribution and uh, application process. Uh, we can start by sending them to you electronically and including the links and if you have further uh, questions we can then provide uh, our individual subject matter experts to you through uh, another video conference set up to delve deeper into the specifics of those areas. Does that sound uh, yeah, this is very, this is reasonable to you? Yeah, this is a very good approach. And uh, if uh, you may allow, I have still two, two, two more specific questions if I, if I can address. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, there is the information security aspects. And, uh, information security is um, uh, being a part of uh, Digital Moldova strategy, and uh, in your feedback, you mentioned about uh, the different measures of uh, increasing the public awareness on uh, the security issues. We also have an, uh, a good cooperation with the NGOs in Moldova regarding the uh, safe internet browsing for kids. So, we are trying to improve uh, uh, the protection of uh, kids in, uh, in the internet area. So it would be interesting for us uh, to see your programs uh, uh, of raising the public awareness uh, on, on that area. And uh, also um, I have learned that there are very good uh, cases on, uh, uh, on the uh, digital literacy for the, we call it third, third age uh, persons or elderly persons uh, that uh, we are also trying to address by uh, uh, different programs to uh, to give them necessary skills to be a part of uh, internet society, as well as to, to provide them more information because uh, right now they are uh, kind of uh, lacking the experience and the interest in, in, in using the internet. If you can have uh, elaborate on, on, on that uh, digital literacy programs. Yeah, I'd love to. Uh the digitalliteracy.gop uh, website here in the U.S. Uh, is a comprehensive uh, program that provides a lot of tutorials uh, and general safety tips for people uh, who are either first, you know, learning about the internet and getting acclimated to it, uh, such as like how to 
uh, you know, protect your computer from viruses, um, not sharing personal information with others on the internet, um, and it also has um, more uh, video uh, how-to uh, demonstrations uh, as well. We also have many uh, NGOs, uh, internet society, uh, learning tutorials that they do to uh, the targeted uh, elderly population uh, here in the US as to uh, basic computer training skills, internet skills. And those have been very helpful because it provides uh, an online uh, experience where uh, people can go have somebody show them something in real time instead of on a computer uh, and walking them through it and you know, answering you know, very basic questions. Uh, and it's uh, wonderful to see how quickly from those experiences people are comfortable you know, getting onto the internet and uh, using the internet uh, to improve their lives. Uh, so uh, you know, many of those programs are done through in local community centers like our libraries will often offer programs for the targeted populations, uh, but also some of our uh, high schools or colleges have outreach programs where they've targeted uh, training for the elderly as a, as a specific needs. Uh, and then also through our, uh, there's a group uh, called AARP, American Association of Retired Persons also has uh, basic uh, information, and I know in the past that they've set up tutorials for uh, people in local areas as well. So it's a, both it's a shared uh, uh, government uh, as well as public uh, experience here in the US, uh, not necessarily heavily federally mandated, but we do provide uh, basic information and recognize the need for it. The need is also being addressed by uh, NGOs and other concerned organizations uh, that want to help ensure that uh, digital literacy is promoted through uh, not just the elderly population, but all uh, populations in the US. Yeah. And including in your plan, I remember uh, the uh, aspect where you were reaching out and having teachers uh, become more digital literate. And I think that's an excellent, uh, an excellent way uh, for then uh, the teachers to work with their students and get them uh, more quickly comfortable uh, working with the internet. So uh, that was an excellent uh, strategy that you developed on that under plan. Um, one thing uh, you did mention cyber and uh, you know, the cyber security. And online child protection issues are also vitally important uh, to the U.S. Uh, the uh, FCC has a uh, sister agency in the U.S. called uh, the NTIA, National Telecommunications uh, and Information Agency. Uh, they have primary responsibility for child online protection programs, and I'll be happy to share a link to uh, their programs that they've developed uh, with respect to child online safety. With respect to cybersecurity, um, the FCC has been working closely with our uh, uh, regulated entities, the internet service providers, the wireless uh, service providers, uh, cable, uh, uh, the fixed uh, broadband uh, providers, in uh, coming up with a collaborative uh, public-private partnership where we uh, work on best practices and uh, recommendations that the industry can then move forward with uh, themselves. Uh, that process here is governed it's under our uh, CISRIC, it's called CISRIC, I'm throwing a lot of letters at you, C-S-R-I-C. Um, it's a, uh, a committee for Reliable. Uh, uh, oh, anyway, the, the name of the, the names escape me, but I'm happy to send you information on how that process works. It's administered by the FCC, where we call together these parties 
that have an interest in uh, cybersecurity at a, a network infrastructure, critical infrastructure level, and look at ways that they should be uh, protecting themselves, which you know helps protect down to the individual user level. Uh, you know, issues such as you know, spam, uh, you know, uh, domain, uh, you know, domain server uh, corruption, uh, issues like that, and they've issued a, a set of recommendations uh, broadly to the community at large, where I think almost 95% of them have adopted uh, these best practices for cybersecurity within their uh, industry. And that has worked well for us, where we've uh, not had to uh, use a heavy hand to uh, enforce these measures. I think the companies recognize that it's to their own benefit, uh, both commercially uh, as a commercial entity, to have a strong uh, network and cyber infrastructure to protect their clients uh, as well as themselves from any uh, data corruption or data loss or data theft. Thank you, that's uh, a lot of information uh, and uh, we would appreciate you to find more information on that because uh, uh, for Moldova as being a young country all uh, the cyber threats are rather new but uh, still we are facing the cyber threats and uh, uh, the protection of uh, personal data is also a hot topic in, in Moldova so uh, your, your uh, experience on that would be uh, much help for us. I wanted to touch on the last question from my side, not to take the floor only on, on my behalf. Uh, it's uh, uh, measurement indicators uh, on the ICT development. Uh, we uh, are measuring our progress uh, based on the uh, indicators that are being uh, historically used here in Moldova and also by the uh, International Telecommunication Union indicators, but uh, in your uh, feedback you provided with the uh, range of uh, uh, another indicators that uh, was interesting for us and uh, uh, my, uh, my uh, request would be to provide more information about the, the way this, the measurements are done because uh, uh, having a different approach on uh, a different snapshot of, uh, of our uh, of our informational society uh, will help us to see maybe a different uh, picture and the uh, different issues that we have to address in, in our in our political approaches and our strategic approaches. Thank you. Yes, the measurement uh, issues here have been, um, we've invested a lot in ensuring that we come up with the measurement programs that we feel are reliable and robust uh, and also uh, pertinent uh, to how our uh, country's ICT environment has developed. We are using uh, a lot of self, uh, self-selected uh, measurement where people can go onto a uh, website that the U.S. government has uh, uh, provided uh, to measure their broadband speeds at home. Uh, we promoted that and advertised that uh, to citizens. And uh, so from your whatever connection you're on, you can go to that link and it will uh, run a test of your broadband uh, infrastructure, including uh, you know, upload, download speeds, uh, as well as latency uh, issues, and it, it records it uh, as a uh, as a link, and then that data is aggregated uh, and uh, reported. We don't single out. Uh, this is, an, I think, an important note. Uh, the individual uh, networks that take part in that, because we we want uh, we want to get broad uh, participation and see. As holistic a picture as possible uh, doing that. We've also now, uh, we're, we're getting ready to proceed with mobile broadband uh, measurement testing, uh, which is relatively new here uh, and exciting. We have a, 
the team uh, devoted to that that uh, they would be happy to, to send you information on or uh, set up another dialogue on both the fixed as well as the mobile uh, testing and indices, uh, including you know, how we measure our adoption and, and deployment as well, which is another factor that you're going to be interested in. Uh, what would what do you with the results of the measurement do you report out those or do you just use them internally within the FCC? I'm just I'm sorry I don't mean to butt in, but I I I, I read that in the um, readout that you gave. And I was interested in actually what what you do specifically with within the FCC with the uh, results of the measurements. We accumulate and report on the data in um, our, we have a broadband progress reports okay. that, that we make, uh, which will be another great link that I can, I can send on to our uh, friends in the ministry. Um, these broadband progress reports uh, aggregate uh, or take in many factors of, uh, of broadband measurements throughout the U.S. and oh. uh, we issue a report uh, on, on those issues to our commissioners and the chair okay. of the FCC. Based on that information, other activities could ensue, such as if we see, if we saw, for example, that there were uh, that advertised broadband speeds were not being met, or they were far, people were getting far below uh, what they thought they were paying for. Uh, in the U.S., you know, there would be a huge consumer outcry about that, and you know, we could, you know, work. Uh, either uh, alone or in concert with the Consumer uh, or, or Federal uh, Trade Commission, uh, which is the sister agency that covers broad consumer issues, uh, to uh, you know, ask the carriers or start an inquiry or proceeding to see, you know, why is this happening? Why are you uh, advertising uh, people are, should be getting uh, you know, 25 megabits per second, but they're only getting four megabits second. So uh, we've been we've been happy that our uh, measurements have indicated that uh, you know for the most part you know if not within 96 percent, uh, which is I think a great rate that uh, companies have done. Uh, and I again I think it's because they they've seen the benefit of wanting to make sure that they uh, they're providing what has been advertised, or people will go somewhere else, which is the, the benefit of another. A competitive environment where you have multiple providers of broadband in a country. Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, I'd like to, to add uh, one more question, but uh, before that, uh, using this opportunity and then after hearing that you mentioned uh, during the discussion on digital literacy, public libraries. I would like to mention that uh, today I had the occasion to participate at the public uh, event where uh, Novateca program, which is implemented with the support of Bill and Melinda Gates uh, uh, Foundation, uh, is promoting uh, digitization uh, and uh, modernization of public libraries in our country. So, so far during the uh, their activity uh, during last year, they uh, succeeded to uh, instruct about 15-20% of our uh, public uh, workers of public libraries, uh, which uh, at their turn will instruct users in, in uh, local uh, and community libraries. So uh, this is a huge step, uh, and uh, we we will see. Uh, from now on, libraries are the new element in promoting digital literacy. So, using this uh, way, I'd like to, to thank you and to thank American people for for, for supporting uh, uh, us in this uh, in this area. Uh, speaking about uh, or, or coming back to questions, uh, I'd like to address uh, one more issue, and I'd like to ask your comments regarding. Uh, digital divide. Uh, here I mean uh, uh, digital divide uh, between uh, sectors or between uh, economical sectors or industries uh, 
I mean here digital divide between social groups or between uh, uh, geographical areas. I know that this is uh, an issue for 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 you too. So uh, that's why uh, we see uh, this uh, this uh, problem as. Uh, uh, one of the, the main concerns. Uh, so uh, you know, uh, you, you might see more uh, in, in uh, the introductory part of the uh, strategy that we have good indicators in the broadband promoting. But uh, this indicates indicators refers to uh, almost to urban areas, and uh, uh, we just want to know from your side. Uh, maybe you. you can suggest us more instruments on how to, to deal with this issue and uh, which, uh, uh, which are the secrets for, for, for uh, solving this, uh, this problem at uh, regional level and intercultural and intersectoral levels. Thank you. Yes, the digital divide has been, um, been a key uh, uh, concern here. Uh, at this as all over the world uh, for uh, us in the FCC, uh, we've been concerned that uh, as people benefit greatly from the uh, broadband speeds and internet access, uh, that those who don't have it are being, you know, being left out. And being left out in uh, the information age uh, has uh, drastic consequences, uh, educational, uh, health, uh, I mean, just you can benefit from so much with uh, broadband and uh, access to uh, you know, the wide information available uh, that to be left out uh, would, would be tragic. Uh, we've developed uh, programs uh, that are targeted to uh, low-income families where we find that uh, adoption rates are uh, far below those with uh, higher income levels here in the U.S. Uh, where we provide uh, you know, subsidies to, to those families, uh, as well as a program that was started, um, Connect to Compete, uh, is it's what it's called. I'm happy to send you information on that as well, that provides uh, computers, uh, basic computers, uh, uh, and laptops to low-income uh, families uh, in the U.S. Uh, that qualify. And by uh, no means are those the only areas uh, and ways that we're uh, trying to uh, bridge uh, the digital divide uh, with the U.S. Uh, we also have struggles uh, not only with the adoption, uh, but as I was mentioning, deployment. And in the U.S., you know, one area where we're uh, uh, significantly uh, underdeployed is in our uh, the tribal U.S. Uh, Native American populations, uh, which are often in uh, rural or more isolated areas of the country and uh, lack um, high-speed or you know even you know, low-speed access to the internet and communications. And with respect to that target group, we're also making great uh, strides to uh, roll out and uh, make grants and other op opportunities available for uh, the actual uh, deployment of broadband to uh, those areas. So it's uh, it's an area uh, we're struggling with. I think uh, you know most of our counterparts that we engage with uh, also have similar experiences. But um, you know, one area that I think uh, can help uh, down the road with some of the digital divide issues as uh, all of our countries become more robust uh, with the broadband networks is with the mobile, uh, on the mobile side, local access points, for example. Uh, here in the US, there are certain areas where uh, certain companies offer free uh, internet access through Wi-Fi points that they put in their uh, stores so people can, with their mobile devices can get access to the internet. So I think as your populations, uh, as our populations get more uh, familiar and have more demand for uh, 
mobile and uh, fixed access. Uh, you know, I think economically, it should you know increase the availability, drive down prices. Um, I know you've, you've noted that in your uh, plan that it will make it a more competitive environment and uh, enable more of the population to benefit from from those services. But I think it's it's very important that we uh, work within the schools. Is a, is a great way to help level the digital divide because uh, at that level, you know, the students, uh, regardless of their income level, can have uh, access and learn uh, without uh, internet and broadband usage and benefit from it at that point. So uh, yeah, that's, that's another very effective way when we talk about digital divide to kind of bridge that gap. Any other questions, colleagues? I wonder, um, it, it appears that um, based on the discussion so far that um, Tom has a list of information that he can, um, further information based on the discussion today that he can, that we can uh, send you via email and possibly based on that schedule a further video conference to uh, provide uh, more information on on more specific topics having to do around the strategy. Does that sound like, and is that agreeable with you, Tom? I shouldn't be uh, volunteering uh, that time. No, I, I've, I've, you know, I've actually offered that already. So um, I, have, I have a quite a list of things to follow up uh, send information on and we would be you know we'd be very happy um, to set up you know targeted follow-on discussions it's part of what we do in the International Bureau uh, we have a program where we uh, do outreach with our counterparts on uh, issues of interest and we'd be happy to uh, you know put that uh, follow-up and that means on any of the areas that you have an interest in Thank you very much. I mean, that is, it, I appreciate the very thorough analysis that you provided to the strategy in the first place on the day. It was very important for me, <laughs> and I know it was for uh, for um, Vitaly and his um, colleagues. So I really appreciate you taking the time today to do this. Uh, Vitaly, is there anything else at this point, or uh, from from now, good? Yeah. Uh, from now. Uh, it is important to state that we, have the, we hold this discussion and we have some conclusions. For us it was important to, to put it on the table, to discuss on it and to um, find some, some new ideas and to be more confident on, uh, on uh, that, that uh, the document is deliverable and we can uh, move forward with this. So, uh, uh, from now, uh, it's uh, it's okay, and uh, your contributions is uh, is very valuable. Uh, thank you for for comments. Uh, we, we we had also comments from uh, Slovenia and uh, from uh, uh, Slovakia. So uh, uh, yeah. Uh, also, uh, mm, I'd like to add that. Uh, uh, in case of any additional information or comments to this document, uh, we will come later, we are available and we will uh, highly appreciate uh, your, your ability to, to resend it to us uh, in order to, to uh, update the document. Uh, we are closer to the point that uh, then uh, it will be presented to the government and to the parliament, so uh, for, for us it is very important your opinion, so thank you very much. Uh, of course, this is not a uh, a holy book or, or something like that. It's, uh, it is open for, for updates in the next few years. Uh, we, we, we think that in two years we will be ready to, to come back to this document, especially to the action plan and to update it. Um, this is the, the uh, uh, this is specific for, for this uh, area, for ICT area and technological development will, will uh, bring us uh, back to this document in one, two years. But uh, at this time we are confident that we are ready to present it further and thank you very much for your contribution.
And uh, also, uh, I would like to say you that uh, it was a very good uh, possibility for us to test our video conferencing system with uh, Russia uh -huh. and with the United States, and we found that uh, there is no jitter or there is no latency, so we have an immediate feedback from, from both sides. Uh, it is very good for us because uh, that means that the international connectivity of the Republic of Moldova is good for, uh, uh, for, for that reason. Uh, and finally, I would like to thank you one more time for, uh, for the uh, information that you have provided. And I hope that uh, uh, I, the number of questions that we have addressed was not so big for us and it was not overwhelmingly much. Thank you. Thank you one more time. Uh, it's been my pleasure, uh, and I uh, really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to uh, address the questions uh, and, and review the plan. Um, we're, again, very delighted to continue working with you. Uh, it was said it's a very impressive and uh, comprehensive, uh, robust plan, and uh, I congratulate you on that and wish you good luck as you move forward and present that to your parliament. Uh, we've had similar experience uh, presenting it to our Congress, but I think you've, um, you've done a very good job, and especially uh, in getting all of your stakeholders together, uh, which I think is a very, very important uh, aspect of developing a plan like this. Uh, everyone needs to buy in, and the only way to do that is through uh, engaging with, with all of the interested parties uh, which is something that I noted that you did and uh, that we've done. So uh, that, I think, will help uh, help the plan get implemented more than anything else. So, good luck. I, uh, I'll start uh, sending through Pat uh, much of the information. And uh, let's continue the dialogue and uh, reach back to us if you have specific questions or want more detail. Uh, presentations or information on any of the follow-on subjects that I'm going to be sending to you. Uh, yeah, I would also let me thank you once again uh, for, for this contribution, uh, Tom, Pat, thank you very much, and they will keep you informed uh, on our further evolutions. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Very great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.